Welcome to video one for week five. We're now moving on from techniques of multiple integration to talk about the other major topic in this course, vector fields. So far for multivariable functions, we've talked about parametric curves, which have one input but multivariable output, and scalar fields, which have multivariable input but one variable output. Now I want to talk about functions that have multivariable input and multivariable output. Now we've talked about these a little bit already before, mostly in the context of changes of variables. The change of variables had multiple inputs, say x, y, z, and multiple outputs, say r, phi, and theta in spherical coordinates. Those of you who've done linear algebra as well will be familiar with linear transformations, which are multivariable functions with multiple inputs and multiple outputs. Those are represented by matrices that act on some number of components of incoming vectors and output some number of components for the outcoming vectors. Both of these types of multivariable transformations were interpreted as changing the environment. So linear transformations were operations on space. You stretch it, you squish it, you project it, you flatten it down, you rotate it, you reflect it. All of these things happen to space. Change of variables is sort of the same thing. We're changing the way we describe the space from describing it by Cartesian coordinates to describing it by polar or spherical coordinates. These changes of variables were an action upon the space that changes what the ambient space is or how it's described. I want to introduce an entirely new interpretation of multivariable functions here for vector fields. So what I'm going to start with is I'm going to start with a region in Rn. So we have multiple variables of input. We're acting on a region where our domains are multivariable domains. And I have a function that acts on this region and outputs vectors in some other Rm. Almost always N and M are going to be the same here, but I might as well define it in general. I don't think of this as changing Rn into Rm. That was my old interpretation. Now I think of this as taking the set S and for each point in the set S, assigning a vector. That's the major idea of vector field. Like a scalar field that we talked about in Calculus 3, scalar fields assign scalars to each point in Rn, or a subset of Rn. And those scalar can be things like pressure and concentration and temperature, things that are reasonable to associate to a point in space and that can vary as we move around in space. Now we're assigning vectors to points in space. So each of these points gets no, no longer a scalar, like a temperature, it gets a vector. These kinds of things can represent the direction and movement and speed of a fluid. So if you're in an ocean and looking at ocean currents, if you're looking at atmospheric currents and wind, then at each point in space, there's a local direction the wind is moving and a local speed it's moving with. So you need a whole vector to describe that. At each point in the ocean, there's a local direction of the current, but there's also a local magnitude of the current, how quickly the water is flowing through that point. So each point in the ocean gets a vector associated to it. This fluid flow interpretation is going to be the first of two very, very important and central interpretations I'm going to make for vector fields. I'm going to really rely on these two particular interpretations throughout the entire rest of the course. So the first is fluids, the second is forces. If I have a gravitational or electromagnetic source of force, a mass or a charge, what it produces is it produces a field of force around it so that if you put an object that has mass near another mass of object, they're going to be attracted by gravity. If you put a charged object around another charged object, they're going to be attracted or repelled, depending on the charges, by the electromagnetic force. The force at a point generated by some charged or massive object is a vector. It has a direction which tells us what direction the object will be pulled, but it also has a magnitude to tell us how strong the force is at that point. So to describe forces caused by objects, gravitational or electromagnetic, I need a vector field. It's not changing the ambient space. The ambient space stays totally the, stays totally the same. What it's doing is it's assigning to each point in the ambient space a vector that says this is the force of gravity on a unit mass at this point. This is the electromagnetic force on a unit mass at this point. That's the main idea of vector fields. Since a vector field is a vector, 
it has components. So if it outputs things in RM, then I can think of it as components. Each of these components is a scalar field, F1, F2 up to Fn. Each of the components of the vectors themselves are scalars. So I can actually use all of the tools I already have, uh, partial derivatives, gradients, directional derivatives, any of the things I developed for scalar fields, I can already use for the components of a vector field. All right, let me do a couple of examples. Here is a constant vector field in R2. So this assigns to every point in R2 the direction 0, 1, which is an upward arrow. So you can see what I've drawn here, any point that I choose in R2 is assigned the same arrow. They're all assigned to this upward arrow. So I associate to all the points in space these upward directions. If this were a fluid flow, this would be a uniform fluid flow. Everything would be flowing upward at the same rate. Uh, entirely uniformly, not causing any disruption, not causing any spinning or turbulence, just everything flowing directly upward all along at the same rate. Here is a vector field representation of the force of gravity. I've given it up here in three variables. The picture, of course, is a two-dimensional slice of that. So the force of gravity due to some mass capital M at the origin is a set of force lines all pointing in toward the origin. Gravity is is attraction, so we want the force per unit mass to be always pointing in towards the origin. Its magnitude is given by a r square, one over r squared law. In order to make this correct, we actually need the exponent three halves here because we also have the length of this vector to take into account. But you can see that by dividing by this length, I get large forces when I'm close, and I get smaller forces when I'm further away. So again, at each point, I have an arrow assigned to that point, a vector assigned to that point, indicating the force of gravity per unit mass at that point. Before I finish this video, let me talk briefly about the operations on vector fields. And what I'm doing here is just extending all the operations I already have on vectors to vector fields. Since a vector field outputs a vector at each point in space, I can do any of the vector operations to the vectors at each point in space. Now I have to do them infinitely many times. I have to do them for every point in the domain of the function, but that's fine. I can do that in general. If I'm given a formula for these things, I can do all these vector operations. So if I have a vector field f, I can look at its length. That's going to be the magnitude of the vector at each point. So that's going to be a scalar field, just turning the vector into a scalar by just looking at magnitude. I can look at its unit direction, assuming that the force, of the field f is never zero. So I'm not dividing by zero, but if the field F is never zero, then I can divide by its magnitude and that will just give me a unit direction at every point. If all I care about is direction but not magnitude, this will give me a vector field of unit vectors assigned to every point. If I have two vector fields, I can add them up component-wise, adding vectors, I can subtract them component-wise, subtracting vectors. I can take the dot product of two vector fields, that will give me again a scalar field because the dot product of two vectors is a scalar. If I have a scalar field little f and a vector field capital F, I can take the scalar product. So at each point in space, I'll calculate the two different functions, and then I'll take the vector and multiply each component of it by the scalar. At uh, this convention here, where I'm gonna write scalar products as lowercase letters, or scalar fields as lowercase letters, and vector fields as uppercase letters, I'm gonna try and keep that convention throughout the rest of the course so that when you see a lowercase f, you know it'll be a scalar field. When you see an uppercase f, you know it'll be a vector field. And then specifically in R3, if I have two vector fields in R3, I can take the cross product. It has to be in R3, of course, because the cross product is unique to R3. And that's just extending all the vector operations I already have. I just do them at each point in the domain, and I get these new results. This will be another scalar or another vector field again, of course, because the cross product outputs another vector, where the dot product outputs a scalar, so f dot g will be a scalar field produced from two vector fields.